Welcome to the Explore Words, Discover Worlds podcasts, presented by Bradford Literature Festival. In this episode, writer and sociologist Keith Kahn Harris and award-winning photographic artist and journalist Robert Stothard discuss their book, What Does a Jew Look Like? Fed up with media cliches around a typical Jewish person, they set out to illustrate the diversity of the Jewish community and celebrate the countless ways that men and women can be Jewish in Britain today. Recorded live at the 2023 Bradford Literature Festival, this episode's illuminating conversation may surprise and inform those of you curious to find out more. And Keith and I collaborated on this um, for about three years whilst I was teaching during when when do we start this there was a big gap during uh, during covid where we couldn't do any work on it so it's hard to tell how long this actually took anyway we're going to tell you the story of our book what does a Jew look like which is a book of portraits and self-portraits by uh, a cross-section of Jewish people um, and I suppose the way uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how the project begins, how I met Rob, how we decided to work together, show you a few pictures from the book, and also try and bring out some of the bigger questions that our project raised. So, a few years ago, I started noticing a strange phenomenon in the British media, which is that whenever there was a story about Jews or about anti-Semitism, or sometimes even a story about Israel, they would be illustrated with a particular kind of photo. Not always, but a lot of the time. And it was strictly Orthodox Jews with black men, with long black coats, black hats and beards, but taken from the back. And I also, uh, and, and after a while I started finding this quite amusing, although I also felt slightly annoyed by it because these are what are known as Haredi Jews or strictly Orthodox Jews and they're an important and growing sector of the British Jewish community but they're only one kind of Jew and sometimes these pictures were used to illustrate stories that actually were not about this, this particular kind of Jew. So I started collecting these pictures uh, in a Tumblr blog which is still up there but I don't maintain it called All Jews Wear Black Hats and Have Beards. And then people would start sending me examples and say, hey, Keith, here's one for your collection. And eventually I started noticing something even more interesting, which was it wasn't just generic pictures of Haredi Jews taken from the back that were being used for any and all stories about Jews. It was the same photo that was being used. And this is it. And eventually, after a while, I started getting really semi-obsessed with this photo, and I thought, well, why don't I try and find the story a bit? How did this actually happen? And it wasn't very difficult. I right-clicked on, on the image, and I found this photograph, Rob Stuttard, stroke Getty Images. Getty Images, for those who don't know, is a big, uh, a, a big online photo library that many national or local uh, newspapers subscribe to or actually individuals can, can use it as well and for a license for a fee you can use a particular stock image whether it's of Jews or anything or anything else but who was Rob Stuttard well again that wasn't very difficult it's got he's blessed with uh, not particularly common surname so I googled him and I found his website and we got to chatting and it turns out that I wasn't the only person who had noticed that his photo was being reused time and time again. He'd noticed it too, and was also, uh, as, as I was, a bit flummoxed by the whole thing. Um, now, Rob can tell you the actual story of this actual photo, so... Yeah, so uh, I started my career working freelance, so working for myself. I was based in uh, the Middle East in... 2011, 2012, and was given a job at the Times newspaper where I worked 
for about a year or so. And after that, I became a freelancer again. And then in the world of news photography, you have newspapers, magazines, but also agencies like Getty Images where you can go and, uh, if you're lucky, you have a contract with them, or if you're less fortunate or more flexible, let's just say, in the freelance world, you work for them on day rates. You can alternatively work what we call on spec or speculatively, where you would go and photograph something, offer it to the agency, hope that somebody buys it. So I wasn't in that situation on this day. I was given a day rate to go and photograph what was deemed to be the news of the day. And uh, this was the, the title of the assignment I was given. So British police to step up patrols in Jewish communities. I should explain the context of that. This was just after, if you people remember, that there were terrorist attacks on Jewish targets in uh, Paris and in Copenhagen and various other, various other places towards the end of two, it was either 2014, 2015. And so this was a reaction to that, that police were stepping up patrols in areas where there were visible Jews who, who were seen to be targets. Yeah, so... Given the assignment, this is the name of the assignment I was given. Uh, the suggestion was that I went to Stamford Hill. Um, I wasn't surprised to be told that was the area I was going. I was familiar with that being uh, an area where Orthodox Jews would be and where police presence was going to be most likely because that's a visible Jewish presence in the city. Um, maybe you could explain a bit about Stamford Hill. Stamford Hill uh, is an area of Hackney which is one of the most multicultural uh, boroughs in the country. Uh, the strictly Orthodox Jewish population there, uh, which is, well, like other places in the UK, it, which is concentrated in uh, Salford, in Hackney, in Golders Green, and also in Gateshead, is growing very rapidly, about 4.5% uh, a year. That population is now outgrowing Stamford Hill and is moving south into uh, north rather into Harringay. I don't know how familiar people are with uh, Jewish geography. Sure, next but, one. Uh, not just yet. So this, I suppose, when I when I went out to, to produce this assignment, I'm looking to produce an image which sums up the the title of the day. So in my head, when I'm heading out, this is the kind of picture I'm expecting to produce, and the kind of picture I'm expecting to get used. This, to me says the story. You have police patrolling the streets of this area of London. If we move on to the next slide, you can see that although I'm looking to create an image that sums up the day, I'm also thinking, well, some certain newspapers might want to make a feature of this story a little bit. There may be a longer piece in the weekend. Maybe it would be useful to have a bit more shooting around that area, give people a sense of place, give people a sense of what the community is like the spaces that people move in, the, the way that people interact, a bit of a broader view of the area. This is, and I'm, I'm sorry it's not too easy to see, but you, you can see that this is, if you were to go onto Getty and, and click on this uh, assignment, this is what you'll see. So this is what the options are for editors when they go in and look for an image to illustrate that story. You can see this was one of the images that I submitted that day. It's not necessarily the one I'd say illustrates the story that well. The issue with working with a news agency is that you, even though you caption the image and you say and you link it to a specific event from the day, there is nothing which says that that has to be the that the image has to be used in that context. The caption doesn't have to stay with the image. The image can be used to illustrate anything you like as long as it's editorial in nature. So even though these images were shot to try to illustrate a story on a particular day, I've created photos which can be used to illustrate other things, and there's, there's no, nothing in law that says that you can't do that. And as we know, that does actually happen. And that's what's happened here. So uh, Rob also told me uh, a couple of things. He actually he actually managed to locate the exact place where that image was 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 taken, and when it was taken, which was Saturday the seventeenth of January, 
Now, for those who know stuff about the Jewish community, they will know that, well, what's special about that is Shabbat, it's the Sabbath. Uh, that explains several things. One, it explains that, uh, that the photos in this set of images, they're actually in their Shabbat best. They wear their best clothes for the Sabbath. Uh, but it's also quite striking, because if you were to do that sort of photo set in a Haredi neighbourhood in Israel, Rob would not get uh, much of a welcome, but because this is Britain, uh, it, it was different. But Rob, you weren't really aware of the, uh, the Shabbat issues at the time, were you? No, and I wasn't made to feel uncomfortable either. And you also, to and Rob also told me something that was really interesting about his famous photo, which is in the same photo set, there are actually uh, pictures of the two men taken from the front, but actually those have never been used. I've never found an instance where people have used that. The one from the, the back is the only one that's been used. It's quite interesting to think why. And anyway, this is what they look like. Um, and you, you said that they, were, they sort of nodded hello to you? Yeah, I think there's obviously different people work in different ways. And I think for a, for a while I, there was an assumption that I was um, kind of coyly photographing these people with their backs to me. Um, and that, that I'm not saying that's not an appropriate way to work. It's just not the way that I like to work. Um, and I think it's it's really interesting that the picture that got used so much is of these two people, but f from from a way which implies there's been no interaction, um, from a way that implies that you can't maybe engage with these people and share a glance, get that kind of recognition of the quite large cameras that you have around your neck and what you're doing. Um, so I think it's, it's, it, it was important to me to, to file these pictures, firstly because I think they're, they're reasonable pictures and they do illustrate uh, this scene in London quite well. Um, but I, I think it's interesting that you felt you didn't appreciate that maybe there had been that kind of interaction with me and the photographers, but you didn't know me at the time, so we hadn't had that conversation. No, I assumed that you'd been out snooping, uh, which you hadn't, and I know now, well, know you quite well now. I know that's not what you would have done. The other thing I did was I got very excited once Rob pointed out that there was a picture of them for a front, because I thought, well, I want to fight, track them down and see uh, what they actually thought of it. I'm assuming that it's a father and son, he looks like a father and son. Um, now, it's a big stereotype to suggest that all Jews know each other or that all strictly Orthodox Jews know each other. However, it took me 30 seconds to find out <laughs> who this guy was. I have a contact at uh, a Jewish newspaper that serves uh, the strictly Orthodox Jewish community. And uh, she, she'd engaged with some of, she'd added some things to my collection in the past, my contact there. And so she said, uh, I, I sent the picture to her and said, can you, can you ask uh, around the office? And then, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. Now I do have his name, I could tell it to you, but I'd have to kill you. Um, <laughs> he, I did find a contact to him through a third party. I uh, managed to approach him, and he, he was aware of this phenomenon, and he had been uh, subject to a bit of teasing about the fact that, that him and his son had been, become the most famous Jews in Britain. Uh, but he didn't want to talk to me. Uh, the way it was put to me was he's a modest person and would rather not engage, which of course uh, uh, I respected. Um, he, it, it, modesty is a big thing in the strictly orthodox Jewish community. It is often associated with women uh, because women often cover uh, uh, most of their bodies, but it does apply to men as well. So there is, to a degree, a, I wouldn't say a taboo, but a sense that putting yourself up into the public sphere is not the done thing. He also didn't know who I was and didn't know the, uh, you know, the, the, this, this wasn't just exploitation. So I do have an answer to this mystery, but unfortunately I can't talk about it. So, so that was the story, and it was really helpful for me to have some sense of the context 
uh, by, by in which a particular image can become a stock image. And it was also really important to hear from Rob that he wasn't entirely comfortable with the process. But the next stage of the conversation is, okay, so if you don't do this, how do you do it? How do you find images of what a Jew looks like? And we made the decision to work together on that, but I don't think we really had a particular method in mind. It kind of just sort of emerged, really, didn't it? Yeah, I think we well, you, you had researched through your looking at the, through your, your blog, I suppose, the, the types of images that are around there already existing, existing archives. And there had been, uh, there have been plenty of, of, of books about Jewish communities produced, plenty of uh, documentary books, portrait books, and collections. Um, the collection that you highlight there is quite interesting. Yeah, we're, we're going to share a number, before we explain how we did it, we're going to share another, a, a few examples of how other people have done it because we're not. None of us are claiming that we are that Rob is the first person to take pictures of Jews. <laughs> Many people have taken pictures of Jews. It's how you do it that's the interesting bit. So this is you're not really going to be able to see it. This is an Instagram account called Hasidim in Stamford Hill. And one of the things that interested me about it is that you can't tell who is doing it. You can't tell whether this is voyeurism for outside the community, perhaps with someone with a malicious intent or a prurient interest, or whether this is actually somebody from within that community. I should say that actually using the term Hasidim in Stanford Hill is a bit of a tell, because actually Hus what is known as the Haredi population is sometimes conflated with Hasidic Jews, but Hasidic Jews are only one section of that population. There's also what's sometimes known as the Yeshivish or the Lithuanian stream or the Litvak stream, which is, which is historically very different from the Hasidic population, but, but is now much, uh, much, much closer together than it used to be. And if you don't know the community, the, the black hats and the beards seem identical in both. So this does show that there is this sort of interest in who these people are. But it's very ambiguous as to, what, as to what is motivating it. I also found this, which is this extraordinary photo archive that is held by the Wiener Library. It's called the Broad Archive. And this is a, 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 Haredi, a Haredi person from Stanford Hill who took 500,000 photos of, of, of life as he saw it around them. And this image there, I hope you can see it, shows how radically different it is to the sort of image we mostly see of Haredi Jews. This is two people singing and being happy <laughs> together and enjoying life and being not black and heavy and mysterious or stuff like that. On the other hand, it's also, there are questions here about if you want to portray a community, do you do it as the way they want to be seen? because things can get lost that way, can't they? Yes, and there's... Um, I, I feel with this archive, there's, there's, there's a kind of access which, which is quite different to the kind of access that maybe I would, I would get and, and maybe to a, more, um, a less broad part of the community as well. Yes, because, I mean, this is a Haredi Jewish man, so he's unlikely to, to want to include pictures of Haredi Jewish women. He probably has limitations in his, own, uh, in his own context within it as well. But also, the motivations, the motivations are similar. There are motivation around kind of celebrating, but maybe the, the, the person who's curated this is trying to celebrate some part of themselves um, rather than the people that they're photographing. So maybe this is a more of a personal approach to the, to, the, to the question that we're asking. But it is an interesting project, as much as anything, because it's an antidote to the way Haredi Jews are often seen and observed and gazed at. Here's another example, quite different example, of, of a photo library. 
that was deliberately set up uh, to counteract the lack of visibility of one part of the Jewish population. And this was set up by a group of Orthodox Jewish women in Israel uh, who were concerned about the, uh, the erasure of, uh, of Orthodox women from the public sphere. Certainly in the Haredi population, most Haredi newspapers now will not show pictures of women, which is a relatively new development. Uh, but even outside that community, there is often a, uh, a, a concern about portraying Orthodox women as being somehow inappropriate. So this, the Jewish Life Photo Bank is a, a set of stock images of, uh, produced within that community of, uh, of, of, of Orthodox Jewish women doing things like praying, which of course marks them out as being at the relatively progressive end of orthodoxy, which are the, and those are often the ones who are particularly concerned that they are being erased uh, from, from the fact that they could be doing Jewish ritual. But I think both Rob and I both thought that we were, we were not looking to produce stock images, were we? Absolutely not, no. Um, and I think, for me, the, the difficult thing about trying to work as a freelancer was this necessity to, to give, give images away for stock. There's been a, a big move in the, in the, not just in the, in the news, news world, but in broadly in magazines as well, that anything you produce becomes available for, for reuse and reimagination. And uh, photos can quite quickly become uh, decontextualized and, and and purely illustrative rather than contributing to a conversation um, so I suppose what we the next example we're going to show um, maybe shows a, a way a way to to do this which I think we think is really good but wasn't quite what we wanted to do so this um, project by John Offenbach is a series of a, a really big series of portraits. It heads into 60 or 70 subjects, I think. Um, now, this book, um, this was exhibited at the Jewish Museum in London. The, the process here is, it, is that kind of antidote in a way, isn't it? Well, I mean, it, it, it does something quite interesting. It, it, all of the pictures in this book are taken against the same background. They're, they're this, uh, and they're all in this sort of quite stark black and white. And they're of Jews around the world, but all against the same background. And there is minimal contextual information. So there's a picture of the comedian Matt Lucas. And it says, Matt, actor, London. <laughs> That's as much contextual information as you're going to get. Sometimes they're holding things. I think there's a picture of a butcher and he's got his cleaver in his hand. But often the point of this is, as in this picture on the front, is to say, is to ask the question, if you didn't know that this person was Jewish, what would you think? I think it also, it does, it re reduces to a particular form deliberately, I suppose, through, through the use of the same background and the same lighting. I think this this project was perhaps designed to create um, kind of a, a level playing field th through which there was something shared amongst every person in the book, from which then was added on their profession, their name, and that where they're from. Um, and I think that didn't work for us, partly because it had already been done. So we're going <laughs> to redo done. it. I, mean, I I have to say that these are wonderful photos in this book and I appeared on a panel with John Offenbach and I did say so. Uh, but I w there's also a certain amount of frustration and I do find this sometimes in a certain kind of photography which is, I want to know more. <laughs> I want to know about the circumstances. I'm not saying that's, that it always needs to satisfy that need but I think it was a, a desire to know more that, that we've tried to, that's how we approached our project which is, what does a Jew look like? Uh, which came out... Uh, last April? La April, la April last year. And um, 
it, it's, I would say it's partly, a, a, we wanted it to be something that looked lovely and that had wonderful pictures, and, and, but also that was educative as well, but educational without being incredibly uh, worthy and dull. Um, and also not not a photo book, not something which is extremely expensive and uh, would just um, is designed for for a coffee table. Something which um, the whole point of the book was to to deal with uh, a little some anxieties of mine, so a, a bit of a redemption in some ways. Um, and for you, it was. An, an excuse to... For me, I've been writing a lot about Jewish diversity over the years, and so it was part of that. It was, I wouldn't call it the project to celebrate Jewish diversity exactly. It's just to say there are lots of different kinds of Jews, which is an incredibly obvious thing to say, but the implications of that are actually quite important to think through. And the book is also about... A ch it's not, as I say, it's not an alternative set of images for the media to use. It is an attempt to, to challenge people in the media. And we've done a couple of seminars uh, w w with people in the media to just raise, uh, raise this sort of issue and to use it as a conversation starter. I should also say how we work together, which was, um, I'm a big believer in trust in the professionals. And I also think that uh, Rob, the fact that Rob isn't Jewish was a great asset to the project because it means he could be seen as, I mean, no one's entirely neutral, but he, the sort of conversations he would not have with the subjects would be uh, finding people they know in common, which whenever two Jews meet, <laughs> that's what they do. They play Jewish geography. Um, so Rob wouldn't be doing that. So I, my job was to find a good cross-section of people, and then I sent Rob to go away and work with them on a on a portrait they would both uh, both like and, and, and feel proud of. And then after the portrait was done, I would, I, I would either interview them um, or I, they would write something. And it was, it was essentially a self-portrait in words. And it created this very, very simple structure. This is how the book is. On the right is the portrait. On the left is the person in their own words. And this is the actual, this is actually the cover picture, but we put it on the cover as a kind of photo negative. And this is Yehudis from uh, North Ma Manchester. Some of you might even know who she is if you're Jewish. Do anybody know who she is? You do. She's a fighter, yes, that's true. So the story of the photo sort of, it sort of reflects that, doesn't it? Yeah, there are, there are layers to it that, you, that I had only really noticed recently. Uh, at the at the time, there were there were things which she didn't want to mention in in the text, which I can see referenced in the image. I'm not going to explain um, what exactly, but I think thinking about the process and Keith not being there allowed allowed people to to not to just say, "I want to be in this this space." For whatever reason it was, they didn't have to say, "I want to be in this space because it uh, shows this part of my Jewish identity, or it shows this part another side of me that I want to show." Um, this image, for example, it's all about the kitchen. It's a link to Judas's grandmother, and it's just a space that she feels comfortable in. And the, the fact that she feels comfortable in it means that there are little hints to other sides of her character which are just uh, incidental and that she's maybe kind of forgotten that are there, hasn't gone around and removed a photograph or kind of tidied up the sideboard. She's, uh, Yehudis was a, was, was, came out of the Haredi community in North Manchester. Uh, she suffered sexual abuse and she blew the whistle on it. And since then she's been, uh, as you say, a fighter against... Uh, cover-ups of sexual abuse in the Haredi community. But she said in the years when she was abused, this was the, the kitchen in what was then her grandma's house, but is now her house, was like her sanctuary. So this is, this is like the opposite to John Offenbach's approach. This, this is a picture of her in a particular concept. 
And she also doesn't want to change the kitchen at all. Um, it's almost identical to when the house, I think it was, um, I think her grandmother was the, was the first person to live there and it was a, built in the 60s or 70s, I think. So even, even the boiler is original in that house, <laughs> a 50 year old boiler. I think um, she may have to change the boiler at some point, but, but <laughs> that'll be in the next book. Yeah. Uh, here's another. This is uh, this is one of my favourites. This is uh, uh, he's uh, Yeheskel, who lives in West London, and he's a, he's a rabbi. And this, at first sight, looks like a very. We we're talking about it last night, and Rob said it's quite quite a plain, quite minimal, quite tranquil sort of photo. But but with the text next to it, it, it starts to become sense. So he's he that's his lectern. Now Orthodox Jews. When they study, they will often have a lectern to put the, the, the book of the Talmud or whatever it is to study. And he'd actually made the lectern himself, which of course is it, it's evidence that Jews sometimes do, do manual labour. Uh, but it's made out of wood that grows at a certain high level in Switzerland because he is Swiss. And he grew up in a family uh, with only a tenuous connection to Judaism. I think he only found out he was Jewish in early adolescence or something. So, and he's also dressed, I think, like a Swiss gentleman farmer. Um, it's Harris or, Tweed. It's Harris Tweed. Well, okay, or a Scottish gentleman farmer. Um, but, but what he is saying there in that picture is, this is my, I, I, I study, I am Jewish, Jewish text is central to who I am. But I'm also still, the, the material circumstance in which I emerged from still actually means something. But it does it in a much more minimal way than the picture of Yehudis does. Yeah, and I think what's interesting about this is how this space where he uh, reads and, uh, and writes, I think, as well, is, and thinks, um, is actually like this. this is a cur he's curated this space. And you've got... Some hints to the the mountains where he where he grew up. Some a portrait of his grandfather behind him. I didn't I didn't make this as clean and um, and, and hinting at his character at all. This is him and he curates this space for himself. And I think I think I thought that was really interesting. I mean, not every picture is taken in a house, but it seems the next one's also in a house. Uh, but this is. Uh, somebody famous. Uh, anyone remember Dennis Pettis? <laughs> Paul Kay. He's he's like he's now a sort of he. Uh, what would he he's a character actor, I think. He gets a lot. Of, he's been in Game of Thrones. He's been in lots of other things. He lives in Finchley. He lives in. Uh, and the reason I I know him vaguely is because both my kids and my my son and his son went to the same Jewish school in Finchley, and I suppose. We want to show it partly to show, hey, some Jews are famous, but also I love the denseness of this. I mean, this, this could not be less like the John Offenbach uh, picture, could it? I mean, this is, this is somebody who's not a complicated, uh, sort of interested in objects and materiality and visual stuff. Uh, it, it would seem to be such a waste to sort of take a picture of him against, say, a, a, a sort of blank background, wouldn't it? Yeah, and w not precious at all about. Uh, well, you can't see the dust, but um, this the the kind of the the clutter that's there, and it and actually, in many ways, because it's so busy, you really do just focus. You focus on him, um, and maybe that is maybe that's part of his intention to have all of this kind of chaotic things around him, but. Uh, him and a few other people were asking who else we were going to photograph and were asking, I suppose they were saying, which other actors, which other musicians, which other celebrities are you going to photograph? And um, we have in a way, but not... Well, we have, I mean, there are some people who are pictured in the book who I would say Jewish, who are Jewish famous, uh, although not the next one, Not actually. the next one, Not the next one, <laughs> Uh, the next one is is not famous, and this is the total opposite uh, to the other ones. Uh, anyone know what's special about this one? It was it was uh, taken in prison. 
Uh, this is, I just noticed that Rio's here. There's somebody from the book. We're not actually show, we're not showing all the pictures. We didn't, not showing yours. But uh, he is, if you buy the book, you'll see him there. Sorry. I, <laughs> Rio, the token Jewish punk. That's right. <laughs> An ex-candidate for mayor of, de deputy mayor of something. Anyway, that's the central conversation. I just got completely distracted. Anyway, this is a Jewish prisoner. Uh, we, uh, that was one of the ones that I went to uh, as, uh, as well. When I mentioned to Yehudis, when I saw her, she asked me who else was going to be in the book. I said, well, we're going to photograph a Jewish prisoner. I said, oh God, it's not my abuser, is it? Fortunately, it's not Yehudis' uh, abuser. He's not, he's not in prison for anything other than that. I, I thought this was, it was a quite a sad experience, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the... The whole the whole process of being there was was really I found really moving. We were we were invited um, by well, I don't know how much we can say about. She was the chaplain. She was the chaplain. We were invited by the chaplain, um, and there was a small group of Jewish prisoners that we joined for the the a weekly weekly meeting. I suppose yeah, they have, like and um, it revealed that this this young man had had only really started to engage with his um, his Jewish identity whilst in prison, and the chaplain had been had been really uh, really important to him and he was he found it difficult to to talk to i think he was um, going through a huge amount he 'd had some traumatic experiences he 's also illiterate, which is something that causes him an awful lot of embarrassment. But the other Jewish prisoners, actually, they sort of took care of him, actually. It was one of the better prisons, I think. He said it was less violent than others. Um, he did say that in, in other prisons he'd been in that he, he wouldn't have been open about uh, his fam family's heritage, um, the, particularly the Jewish side of it, partly because of other prisoners, but I think partly also because when, when he was back in back home or back wherever he was living, that he was worried that that would affect his relationships as well. So, somebody going through a really quite a complex and complicated um, kind of process of understanding their identity, and um, partly why that, that he didn't want to be um, easily identifiable in his picture. So this is again part of the process of working with working with our subjects, making sure that it was something that they were happy with. Um, I suppose we, we can mention that part of the process of choosing the pictures was also collaborative, so we offered pretty much every subject the chance to choose the picture that they wanted. Did we, Rio? I hope so. <laughs> so they're given an opportunity to choose the picture that they liked, which actually for me was, on occasions, became quite quite a difficult process i think what i like i think i lost my lost my bottle once <laughs> i mean i think it's interesting actually that some of the people in the in the book they were photographed at you know that was it they were fine they signed whatever thing they needed them to, no we didn't sign anything i sent them information about how your picture was used they didn't respond paul cares <laughs> never responded to, to it when i've informed him about this stuff you'd expect that he's photographed a lot other people were incredibly invested in how they were presented, both as Jews and as, 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 as human beings. And it was hard to see how much that was because they were being photographed as Jews or, or otherwise, or whether they were just people who were very invested in how that they would be represented. Yeah, I think it goes beyond being image conscious, I suppose. I think we all, in various levels, are, are concerned about our image and how it's used. Um, but nobody, and I think you reflected on this quite a lot, nobody was concerned about who they were going to be next to in the book. Nobody was saying, oh, I, I want to be in the book, but I don't want them to be in so, the book. So my big fear was, it was I wanted to include political diversity in the book, as well as ethnic diversity and whatever else. Um, so there, there, there are two people in the book who were on very, very different sides in the anti-Semitism controversy in the Labour Party. And I lived in fear that once they saw the book, they would say, how dare you put me in the same book as them. I was also the Orthodox Jews in the book. I was concerned that there's one person who's trans. How dare you put me in a book with, with someone who's trans? And we haven't had any criticism whatsoever from those people. None. 
And I think that's because the book is incredible. It plays with a straight back. It is what does what it says in the tin. It doesn't say, hey, look, all these Jews are great. It just says, this is who these people are. And I think, I, I, th I still can't quite believe I got, got away with it, to be honest. <laughs> well, and I think, even, and, in the, and, in the, and in the words that are shared as well, there, there isn't any, um, there isn't much kind of electioneering, prophesizing. No, there, there wasn't, it was quite personal. And in fact, yeah, I, we need to get on actually. So let's, there was another story I could tell, but I'm not going to. So this is somebody who's Jewish famous. Does any Jews here know who that is? He's not that famous. He's also London Jewish famous. Uh, this is a Adrian Cohen, um, who has been involved in lots of things, including the Jewish labour movement, various other things, like uh, the London Jewish Forum. He's sort of like the, the, the trustee of multiple charities. And that was taken... He wanted to have his picture taken in his synagogue, which had recently been refurbished, uh, because that was, all, that was his home as much as anywhere else. And I know it sounds a bit obvious to say that, that Jews sometimes... There are actually two or three others who are pictured in synagogues as well. That is, for some Jews, that is their home, particularly someone like Adrian, who prays, uh, who's Orthodox, prays on a daily basis. Um, and we did ask people... Uh, the things we asked them were, is there, a, is there a place where you would be most comfortable being photographed? And I do wonder if, because of... If, we, if the book was... Was, was something else, if they were being asked to be photographed for a completely different side of their character, would they have chosen those spaces or not? Yeah, I mean, we were upfront about what this book was, which is the only way it could have worked. Um, this, is, this is somewhere where actually Rob pushed back against the choice, but I think it works brilliantly. This is a woman called Yale, y Yael. She's originally from America. Her father was uh, from, from Baghdad. So we made sure in the book that not everyone was, was Ashkenazi Jewish. She is a, uh, she's an Orthodox Jew. Her husband's uh, a rabbi associated with the Lubavitch movement. Uh, but she's also this ball of energy and this very high-flying businesswoman. One of the things I love about that is this is, is and I think this was Rob's vision, of it, is that it, she looks here like a Jewish housewife. And it, but when you read her, her text next to it, it shows that it, she's totally subverting, subverting that idea. Inter the other layer in it is that she's actually wearing a, a wig, which is a head covering that some Orthodox Jewish women wear. But it's the most amazing shaitel that you've ever seen. <laughs> you wouldn't actually know. So that's what, another example of how that contextual knowledge actually helps you to, to turn what looks like a very conventional image into something actually quite almost peculiar really yeah and i wouldn't say that this this photo i i think she looks very comfortable and very relaxed but she wasn't for a long time she wanted to be photographed stood up um almost in a i would call like a like a, Take a power off. power power pose um out she wanted to be outside in nature uh looking different let's say um and i pushed for this image because i f i felt that it that she just looks extremely comfortable and relaxed and happy in it and um and she did actually she did comment that um she hadn't she hadn't really thought so much about relaxing at home she travels so much for business that maybe she didn't realize so much that this was somewhere where she felt relaxed and happy and it's not the image that she projects to others, maybe. Yeah, so I think it was useful. It was surreptitiously counterintuitive. I well, think. in some ways, I was very fortunate to even be allowed through the front door. Y y yes, indeed. Um, so we've got to skip on. This is another count. This is an image of a Scottish laird in his Highland uh, uh, fortress uh, wearing tartan. Uh, it's actually an image of a uh, American um, lecturer. He's an academic, yeah. um, and it's taken in the centre of Edinburgh. Um, and he's gone like totally native since he's come to Scotland. That's his own tartan. But that is that tartan is in the collection now in the tartan collection up in Scotland because it's um, 
I, I don't know exactly how it's described, but it's his Jewish family's tartan. It's like, I mean, I, I, one of the things I love is you've captured this, it's this masquerade of this sort of tough, craggy gentleman farmer um, when he's not. And I think there's something wonderfully playful about it that, I, that I very, means I'm very fond of this one. I hope he gets the irony as well. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, I think that this image was, I think it was used in the v and exhibition recently about Tartan as well, so. Oh, I didn't realise that. Oh, we, so this is the final image we're going to share. Um, and this is an artist called Tiller, uh, Tiller Crown, uh, an amazingly talented woman. Uh, she's author, uh, she, you may not see it from here, but she is an Orthodox Jewish woman, and she is wearing a uh, hair covering and a long skirt. Uh, but in, in a fairly unconventional way. And this, this picture, which I think is just about perfect, um, and you'd expect it really from an artist collaborating with a professional photographer, has been one of the images that, has, uh, that people notice. Some people say it has a sort of Vermeerish quality, and I personally love it, but something quite funny happened with it, which also, I think, taught me uh, a lesson about why certain pictures stick out. Tiller co-writes a fanzine with her husband called Private Oi, and she put together this, this collection of uh, articles about the book, all of which had her picture on it, and it was this thing said, overused image finally replaced. A new book showcased portraits of a diverse range of modern British Jews, unlike its press coverage. And we sent like 10 possible images to, to any paper that covered it and said, choose one. Yeah, we but, checked with, the, we checked with people we checked who would be happy yeah, because we, some people didn't want their images to be spread around. Obviously, the context of the, the book being produced was about an image that got overused. So we were very careful that we checked with people we said to the, we didn't give it to a news yeah. archive. Um, but still, they all used it, almost all of them used that picture as the cover image. In fairness, the Bradford Literary Festival did not use that image. They used the image we're not showing here of a, of a, of a, of a black Jew from uh, Sheffield. Sheffield. Um, so I think one of the things that's taught me is sometimes things get picked up on as much as anything, because they're really good. And I think we have to remember that Rob's original photo is a fantastic photo. And that's one of the reasons why it gets used a lot. Uh, uh, there's more to say, um, but I think we should probably stop there and take questions. Um, thank you. I'm Gila. Um, I couldn't help but notice that most of the images that you shared are of people of pale skin, uh, seemingly Ashkenazi. Um, I was just wondering if you had any other images of, say, uh, Iranian Jews like myself or, yeah, people with different, you know, Yeah, we are very, very careful to do that. We have one Jew who is an for Iranian background. Uh, we have Yael, who's from Baghdadi background. Uh, we have, I think, a couple who are Sephardi. Uh, Elliot's per, per, he's, per, he's the Iranian one, uh, Elliot. Uh, we also had uh, uh, the image that you saw on the, when you bought tickets for this session, who is, uh, who's, I can't remember his exact heritage. I think he might be either African, Afro-Caribbean or an African... Uh, origin. Uh, he's a convert to Judaism. He lives in uh, Sheffield. So we were careful about that because we didn't want to be, and we also have converts <laughs> as, as well in the book. Um, thanks, thanks very much. The talk was fabulous. Um, I um, I'm also a little bit hungover, so if I'm incomprehensible, please forgive me. Um, I just guess my question... Uh, 4.35 <laughs> in the afternoon. It's quite impressive. Um, my question is do you... Th uh, so I noticed that the subject of looking Jewish seems to be reappearing in uh, like Joshua Cohen's novel, uh, Charlie Kaufman's novel, there's a lot on the, um, you know, things like Broad City. And I wonder always, is, do you think that 
writers and artists, or Jewish writers and artists, are responding to anti-Semitism, or do you think it is them expressing their Jewishness, not necessarily linked? I always wonder about that. Is it a linked response, like this, this these rep these discussions? Um, yeah, and I think that, like I was curious about your book and, and the time it came out. So, I mean, I. I have to be aware, I haven't read the books you mentioned, which I'm slightly ashamed of. I think there's certainly, judging for, partly from the response to this book, that these issues are very live ones. And they're also becoming discussed in, a, in the Jewish community in a more sophisticated way. So the, the thing that you asked, that was something that I knew people would ask about because I knew that we are having these discussions about what's sometimes called Ashkenormativity right, assuming that all Jews are like me, <laughs> originally from Poland or or wherever it is. So we're having a more, a more sophisticated conversation about what it is to look Jewish. But, but it's also, we're also, I think many Jews are now aware that their, uh, that their susceptibility to, to certain kinds of anti-Semitism often depends on how they look. So Haredi Jews are the ones who are most likely, the Jews are most likely to have physical assault. And that's the case in, it's quite a serious problem in, in America, it's serious, quite a serious problem in Stanford Hill it's, it, it, itself. Um, but I think the idea of what people, I mean, we've, we've done some sessions in, in, with media people to try and raise these sort of questions. And, and I think it's fair to say that, that We've often just made people, we've tried to make editors' lives much more difficult <laughs> in dealing with this sort of thing. Yeah, I suppose my, the way I would approach editors would, would be spend more money, send people to go and illustrate the stories you want to illustrate, I would say, properly. But I'm, I'm coming from, it's a selfish position because I want photographers to get more assignments to be paid. So the, there's a, it's a difficult thing to answer. I mean, I, th I think we. I think this is a debate that needs needs to happen. I think it is happening. I think it is more complex than it used to be, and that's a good thing. But I think we're probably at the start of a very long process of disentangling the complexities of the Jewish look, because the problem is you can't say Jews don't. <laughs> You, you can't, it, it, it's wrong to say Jews look, can look like anything because it is true, Jews can look like anything. But it's also true to say that there are certain visual types. And it's certainly true to say that, that many people like, who spent most of their life around Jews can pick Jews out. But how do you, how do you acknowledge that while also saying that their Jews can be, cannot be what Jews expect them to look like? How does the Jewish community itself deal with its own issue of racism? Uh, of, for example, when uh, black people come into to synagogues who are Jewish and they get intrusive questions saying, what are you doing here, basically? So it, this is a very, very tough issue, but I'm glad that we've at least made a little bit of a contribution. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, my, my question was in terms of as you said, Jews can come in all different, all different colours, all different shapes. But the reason why you wanted to portray a particular looking type of Jew is because you say they're, they're identifiable, so therefore they're more likely to experience anti-Semitism. Um, I think that's what you said, isn't it? Because if, if, if they look, um, if, if they look um, like traditional, authentic Jews, your characteristics, or, well, orthodox Jews, is it? You know, if you you want if you portray them because there you say they're more vulnerable because they're more identifiable, so they're more likely to be victims of anti-Semitism. Is that what you said? No, I'm not. That's not about the book. In the no, book, no, 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 not about the book. But you said because of the way that they look, you know, that it's it's clear it's easier to see that they're Jews, so they're more likely to experience anti-Semitism because of the look. Yes, I think that's yeah, yeah, certain no, kinds no. of anti-Semitism. No. Well, anti-Semitism, it's still... What I mean is they're a bit targeted because they're looking away, which identifies them as being Jews. 
Jewish people. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's the common ground which I'm getting at. Because like I said, you already answered the next part. So therefore, a black person is always going to be black. So the racism which you experience as being Jewish isn't necessarily the same as black, because if you're black, you're always going to stand out and be identified as being black. And you, ex and you already admitted that there is racism within the Jewish community, like there is in all religions, and most people of religion don't accept that. So the, which, um, which, which I wanted to come on to was, the most important thing would be more, you need to appreciate all different religions, as many as you can, but in terms of what it looks like to be a human being, because whoever you put up there, they're still a human being. So in terms of what a Jewish person is, a religion person is, is what do you define as being a human being or not? And then that will define how you practice your religion and how you see things. So it's not that I disagree with anything you've said. It's just... But, but the... I do agree to, a, to an extent, but the thing is that there are also commonalities. And whilst, it, 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 whilst there is an enormous diversity of, of different kinds of Jews, there are some types that are more common than others. So the difficulty in doing this sort of portrait of, of a people is how you balance the need to show the diversity with also acknowledging that for example, the majority of Jews in this country are Ashkenazi Jews who, 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 who can pass as white. Well, I don't use the term Jews as, as, as a religion. It's Jew, Jews are a people. Well, what is a Jew is a, is a, is a debate for a, another session. That's what I mean. Yeah, they, they are they're, they're human beings. But not just human beings. They're also human beings who do particular things who identify in particular ways. But it's not, it, it's not a contradiction. Hello. Um, so I remember when the book came out, there was, uh, there was uh, some coverage in The Guardian, uh, one of the ones that, that had that. With Tiller at the front. <laughs> yeah. um, I wonder if you've noticed in the sort of 18 months since it's been published, or no less than that, um, whether at least the Guardian has made more of a, a concerted effort to not rely on these same types of images for articles that discuss Jews. Well, I, I, at our launch last year, we were actually with the head of photography, uh, Fiona Shields, who's head of photography at the Guardian. Have you noticed anything? I probably mm, should have. Well, <laughs> the the Jewish Chronicle reused. They, the Jewish Chronicle also reviewed the book. And then only a few months ago, they used the original image again. No, but it was no twice in the twice. last twice in the last year they've used Rob's famous image, the Jewish Chronicle. They gave us a double page, it was three pages even devoted to the book. But it's like one hand doesn't talk to the other, <laughs> which is. But I maybe we haven't seen that change in the, the when, yeah. I think if we changed the media landscape in eighteen months, that'd have been yeah. quite. What I think has been, for me, very personally, very interesting is that friends of mine have come up to me and since they knew I was working on the project and revealed something about themselves that they hadn't done previously, about a, a grandparent, um, a great-grandparent, a link to Eastern Europe, a link to North Africa, and almost hinting like, if you did this book again, maybe I would want to be involved. And I think maybe that is... Maybe that's a positive place where we're going and something that this book can offer is it gives maybe people a sense that this is something they would maybe like to be a part of. And indeed, what I have noticed is that Jews, and this was even the case before this, is because I've been plugging on about this for years, Jews at least are noticing these things. And I know of at least one case where images have been changed because people have said this is not on. most famous one is years ago there was... A few I swear, four or five years ago, there was a picture of, there was a story about anti-Semitism in the Oxford University Labour Club, with, uh, illustrated with, guess what, image. Now, one thing we know about Haredi Jews is they very, very rarely attend university. So it was a completely inappropriate thing, and they did change it. I don't think I've noticed much with The Guardian, actually, and I have noticed that some of them, that Jewish stories that have been illustrated with pictures of places like synagogues or maybe ritual objects. So I, I, the fact that I haven't noticed much is 
probably a good thing. We're also, though, during the Corbyn years, uh, whatever your perspective, there were a hell of a lot of stories about Jews and anti-Semitism. Since then, there have been much less stories about Jews and anti-Semitism. So it's, we're a bit less visible than we were during, those t during that period. But if you do see things, tell me, point it out. Particularly when it's from the J Jewish bloody chronicle. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. <laughs>